uh, welcome to April 28th edition of This Month in Cyber. Beautiful day. Uh, we'll take uh, maybe 25 minutes or so of time just to kind of recap some stories from the previous month um, with the goal of uh, making us more secure with our uh, smaller mid-sized organization. This month, uh, from an agenda perspective, our intention was to cover uh, security security coverage in general, conferencing tools, and then remote worker scams. Um, uh, specifically, uh, the agenda topics would kind of be around stories in this area uh, with A, B, and C stories. Um, we had hosted a webinar earlier uh, last week that was called uh, uh, For Remote Workers, uh, which we do every Wednesday. And um, the intention there was to talk about remote worker scams. So to some degree, some of those stories are uh, being re-leveraged, uh, re if you will, a week later here, uh, as they didn't go away and they were a good recap of things. But uh, so if you attended that, uh, I apologize if a few slides you've seen before, but um, with that, with no further ado, let's uh, let's jump into things. Let's start with mid-market security lapses. So um, this one's gonna require you to pull out your math skills and uh, do a little graph interpretation with me, but take a look at this uh, website uh, or this graph here. What you're seeing is a list of uh, both high risk and low risk uh, web registrations, new web registrations for coronavirus or COVID-19 out on the internet, meaning every website. Uh, so an example I'll give later is aboutcoronavirus.com. That would be a newly registered website and probably, uh, as, as this will turn out, in the dangerous category. So what you're seeing with the large graph is 5,000 registrations per day were averaging back in late, uh, in mid-March to late March. And um, and then the little blue line, those are what would likely are good and valid coronavirus or COVID pages. So this huge attack surface of phishing sites and um, locations for malware or other malicious uh, activities is out there, right? A large attack surface for uh, the hackers to leverage. Now, um, you know, we can always kind of hope that these websites maybe won't have encryption, but indeed they do, right? The 75% of hackers' websites are also encrypted, so a user couldn't feel any more guarantee about going there. Um, you might hope that like the people that do the registration icon uh, for the internet registration might say, hey, you know, why are you doing this? What's your purpose? But indeed, they're not enforcers at all. Um, they have just very light uh, registration guidance um, for the registered sites like GoDaddy and Network Solutions and others. So we're really, you know, people are allowed to create whatever they like to create and there's not a lot of traffic cops out there. So go do what you like and, uh, you know, I hope that it's not malicious is really kind of the attitude. So are people using it? Uh, Unfortunately, they are, right? This is, a, this is a graphic thing of web traffic going to coronavirus or COVID-19 pages. Now, it doesn't break out which is legitimate traffic versus in a, uh, illegitimate, but you know, 100,000 web hits on a lot of these pages um, in late March timeframe. So certainly our employees are kind of going to that. So it's against this backdrop that I thought would be a good, you know, set the table, if you will, for our security discussion this month. And, and specifically a technology that helps with this, um, with these new websites, right? And sites that are just gaining a reputation. After all, we had labeled previously, some were valid and some were invalid. Who makes that determination? Well, indeed it's traffic cops, right? Traffic cops like uh, DNS filters. Um, and there's technology out there that essentially can evaluate websites and say, you're a good website, you're a bad website, or you're a, you're a website that promotes uh, pornography or um, promotes con, you know uh, this type of uh, activities and therefore um, can be blocked uh, if you have filters to do that at a um, prior to you going to that website at a DNS layer. So uh, one of the technologies we leverage is Cisco Umbrella. We'll talk more about that in the future, but just kind of wanted to let you know that the the industry experts are basically stating, traffic cops are really the only way to prevent uh, going to some of these uh, malicious sites. All right, so with that as a backdrop, I thought I'd also talk about a story. Uh, the story is referenced down there, and when you get the slide deck, you'll be able to click on any of these links to read for more detail. But the summary is such, uh, it's a mid-sized organization, 
they've got great IT people, right? They've got decent process. They've got a lot of tools, right? This is an organization that spends a fair amount of money. Microsoft has a team called the Defense uh, Detect and Response Team, or DART. Uh, they went into this uh, organization uh, at the organization's request about a week after the following happened. Um, here's what happened, and this is a summary slide, and I'll kind of summarize the summary. But in a nutshell, on day one, okay, when the attack first happened, all that happened was that a single employee got a single phishing email and clicked it. And what that did is it provided a door for the uh, malicious attacker to have login and password credentials for that user. And with those login and password credentials, drop Emotet, which is a, as you can see, maybe down the line there, it's called a polymorphic virus. And a polymorphic virus is nothing but a virus that evades your antivirus, especially if you have a older antivirus that uh, might have the very latest signatures, but by being signature-based, it, uh, it can't track a virus that's willing to change its signature, kind of poetic relative to uh, the, uh, you know, the virus and pandemic that we're under now, but it changes its, um, the way it's detected uh, so that it can't be detected by older uh, antivirus engines. Okay. By day four, the hacker has now uh, taken the single mailbox uh, upon which they have entry, and they're starting to send out emails internally. Okay, So you're getting phishing from inside, as well as phishing outside the organization um, to contacts uh, and business associates. And by day eight, okay, approximately a week, 100% of the network, all servers, all workstations, have been impacted with the Emotet, um, which basically is having a detrimental performance on processing and uh, it's similar to like a ransomware. So the organization's effectively down. Uh, total cost of this uh, event for this organization is uh, well into the millions. Um, they had lost revenue and customers. Uh, they obviously had the IT recovery, which took several weeks, including the Microsoft Defense and Response Team. Um, and security implementation of things that needed to be put in because even though they had spent money uh, doing what they thought were proper things, there still were a number of things to be done. And so this brings up, uh, you know, a layout of things that probably should be done, which we'll talk about uh, uh, at the very conclusion of the uh, webinar. So one of the other stories that's kind of been hot uh, in the last 30 days is, um, you know, Teams and Zoom. These are technologies uh, that are getting broadly used. Uh, right now we're using GoToWebinar, WebEx, you could put in that same category. I think there's another one called House Party. In any case, let's just lump that entire category of products into a product set that I think needs further evaluation. Certainly there's been a lot of discur uh, security discussions about it, as well as functionality. And so what we've done as an organization um, is we've laid out uh, some great background guidance on, so when we're talking about functionality uh, as a whole, Teams as a whole has a significant amount of functionality and oh yeah, it does conferencing also. Whereas a lot of these others are more point products, right? Uh, go to webinar, Zoom, WebEx, they're basically strictly conferencing solutions uh, meant, to, meant for people to gather. So um, in the Teams use cases, which I think was our Teams uh, 201 there, you'd see, uh, conferencing is what one of 10 use cases that we point out. You know, voice being a voice system is a second one, which uh, which none of them really have the capability to do. So certainly, uh, certainly, you know, things. Are, uh, Zoom is more of a niche player uh, in that regard. Um, Zoom, I think, by their own quarterly earnings, has about 82,000 customers that are greater than 10 employees. Right? They're very, they're very small employees um, now. As of recently, obviously they zoomed, no pun intended, uh, up to a significant amount of daily active usages. But presumably afterwards, we'll probably focus back down. You know, for example, Microsoft had a million customers uh, with over 650 uh, users. Um, so it's uh, you know it, they're small and large uh, in terms of David and Goliath from and uh, security focused or I'm sorry uh, 
functionality focused on just conferencing or uh, significant other areas. But a lot of the other discussion was obviously around uh, security. And so one of the things we did is we created a couple blogs that sort of capstone some of these things, uh, both from a uh, functionality perspective as well as a security perspective. Um, you know, in Zoom's area, just to kind of recap um, some of the stories you were hearing um, and some of the headlines that I just kind of read out, you know, Milwaukee Board of Elections, right, had a Zoom bombing. Uh, and if you recall from last month, we talked about Zoom bombing, which was, you know, uh, kind of as illustrated in the bottom right there. Mr. or Mrs. Evildoer joins a meeting, right, and ends up disrupting the meeting, um, oftentimes because the Zoom credentials had been provided on a public forum or the administrator account had been um, had been leaked or hacked or phished and therefore they also had administrator creds and could join any meeting that you had set up. So someone participating in a meeting is obviously very disruptive. Uh, the, in Milwaukee Board of Elections, uh, they had to actually postpone their meeting uh, which caused, you know, some delays with regards to the election. But um, one of the other stories that was a headline was um, we had half a million Zoom accounts uh, that were for sale on the web. Okay, well, that's exactly what we were just talking about, right? Some of those credentials are indeed the credentials that are being leveraged to get into some of these meetings too and see what's uh, what's on the schedule for uh, for Frank for next week. Oh, here's some meetings that I think I'd like to participate in. Um, or take those. So, and those credentials, by the way, were less than a penny each. The entire database is $5,000. Um, in March, uh, Zoom had made uh, some admissions that some calls due to their workload had been routed through uh, Chinese uh, servers, um, kind of by mistake. And then in general, there was some uh, industry backlash. Uh, some schools, including uh, the entire state of New York schools, had banned uh, any use of Zoom for some of this conferencing. So all of this was kind of some of the backdrop that was occurring. And certainly, you know, you can look into the security further as we kind of did and, and summarize, um, you know, your own evaluation. Uh, Zoom themselves has taken a 90-day pause for any functionality uh, improvements, and they're just going to focus on security. They also hired Facebook's uh, vice president of security uh, to kind of help them. Um, since then, they've actually modified a number of defaults uh, for security that they already had in place, but people weren't leveraging. And uh, they're looking at, uh, there's some other news coming out now about their use of encryption keys and uh, their inability, uh, because right now they do have ability to actually, uh, from a privacy perspective, uh, do those recordings and where those recordings are stored and, you know, uh, subject to government uh, oversight and things of that nature. So on the privacy front, there's still uh, an uphill battle for Zoom to be fighting. So um, we'll kind of leave it at that. There's, uh, you know, the best overviews are probably provided by some of the guidance, but certainly has been a big story uh, in this month. So let's talk about uh, remote worker scams. We've got a number of items that have occurred uh, through the month of uh April here. Um, both websites and attack surface we kind of chatted about, but let's chat about malware, ransomware, VPN, uh, some FBI warnings, economic stimulus, and uh, some work from home scams that are occurring. So um, again, some of these are uh, repeats from uh, last week a little bit, so I apologize if you attended that, but uh, you know we're at about half repeat on some of these. Just in general, um, I think the Better Business Bureau and the FBI uh, are on record. They've got a lot of guidance out there. Uh, my breakdown from it, and certainly it's linked down below. But in general, uh, you know, Better Business Bureau is saying, you know, be careful about prevention, treatment, uh, cures, and claims that uh, might be out there from a website perspective. Be careful and do your homework, especially hard on donation websites. This is a time when people want to give if they have the capability, yet uh, giving uh, to inappropriate uh, or illegitimate sites is uh, quite rampant. And then um, they also warned, obviously, about stock of companies, right, and dramatically increasing in value because we have the cure or we provide the following service. You know, a lot of those are simply scams uh, to get you to invest monies into locations that are either, uh, that are illegitimate. From the FBI perspective, their main focus has been around, uh, and they've got a lot of guidance, around impersonation. Um, FBI is basically saying uh, criminals are reaching out uh, to people through social media, emails, and phone mail, uh, phone calls, 
pretending to be from the government. Uh, in some cases, they're even going door to door to try to convince someone that they need to provide money for uh, COVID testing, financial relief, or medical equipment. So a lot of just general warnings from them, but let's get specific. Um, here are some uh, emails that were going in inboxes. These were actual emails, uh, right? Upper left-hand corner, I kind of highlighted in the box. This is coming from noreply.who.org. Hey, that seems right, right? Well, if you kind of look at my build here, that's the real site, okay? who.int. And that's the real website and organization. But, you know, imagine this is just WHO is not an organization we probably deal with on an everyday basis. The CDC, um, you know, these are organizations, uh, you know, Alliance for Internet, uh, you know, Alliance for Health. Right. Would we know if that's legitimate or not? I mean, these are all new terms to a lot of us. And as we kind of struggle and grapple with uh, this disease and who are the authoritative bodies, imagine that your employees are kind of having similar challenges. So. Actual emails, actual websites. Now imagine if some of these emails were either A, didn't have some of the uh, you know poor misspellings. I noticed in the upper left as an example that says organization with an S in the box, but then in the email it says organization with a Z in the text. So you know there are certainly some um, some things that would tip you off. Obviously, domain names that are improper, even if we don't recognize them. But imagine if this was coming from an internal employee, such as that example we gave earlier. Uh, that sort of thing can happen, and it makes the email seem that much more legitimate. So something to be mindful of. With regards to VPN, I guess I kind of wanted to point this out. Uh, VPN is suddenly the technology du jour, right? And this is how our remote employees are often working. Um, effectively, it's like taking a network cable and rather than being switched in in the office, you're dragging their network cable to their house and saying, come on in, right? I've opened the door, um, you know, from a patio door, we've kind of moved VPN to kind of a front door for your organization. So even if you have good process and people, um, you can now fall victim to VPN issues and VPN vulnerabilities. So um, specifically, when something goes wrong with VPN, this is a great exposure. And so the story that uh, is highlighted there from the Department of Homeland Security are VPN vulnerabilities. And uh, this is specific to a, a make and model uh, router. Uh, it just had a, had a uh, even if patched to March, they still had issues where effectively, Someone could look at the VPN, uh, someone external to the VPN could look at the VPN and grab in plain text all the Active Directory credentials that were leveraged for accessing that VPN. From there, obviously, they can take those AD creds and do all the work that we saw in slide one, right? They can now send emails as them. They can use remote services, do some lateral movements, take some data out. And oh, yeah, at the end, as if things weren't bad enough, now we'll drop some ransomware in there to hide our tracks, right? Or to extract some additional monies. So VPN vulnerabilities become highly sensitive when everybody's leveraging it. Uh, this one in particular was uh, a particular uh, VPN model, uh, but it's it's just become another uh, area that has to be uh, uh, key focus as we're here in remote workers. This one's kind of interesting. Actually, this has uh, less to do with payments, uh, mistitled there a little bit. This one's more about uh, some of those pharmacies. So um, the idea here, this is a, uh, a showing of searches for uh, chloro chloroquine, okay, which is a, a brand of uh, that was being touted uh, from the government regarding uh, search capabilities uh, and, and potential uh, fixes uh, for the coronavirus itself. Um, so how does money get made out of this? Well, certainly the search capability is up. There's high interest. Well, if there's high interest, uh, it was interesting seeing some of the, uh, in the Krebs article that you'll uh, note from last week, um, there's high interest from the bad guys. They're like, holy cow, look at that interest. Time for us to go make some money, right? And there were actual chat sessions where they were taking the actual chat. And so how do they make money? Well, there's something called affiliate pharmacies out there. And these affiliate pharmacies, have names like uh, Eva Pharmacy, um, RX Partners, uh, Malian, Alien Target. Um, they've been around for more than a decade. And in fact, they had their origins in being um, large scale botnets and malicious software sites uh, for uh, 
for enslaving computers, but as they've kind of morphed and graduated through the years, they've become pharmacy sites and front ends. So the uh, they'll actually be front ends for pharmaceut uh, pharmaceuticals in India, China, and other parts of the world that will ship these products via international parcel post to customers. Well, great. How effective has that been? Well, here's PharmaCash. It was their third largest seller in the month of March. Okay, it represented 25% of their sales. Several million dollars of product were being shipped through PharmCash, just one of many vendors. Okay. The front end for PharmCash is about coronavirus.com, okay. which as of the posting of his article on April 24th was still up. Right? It takes the FBI a while to find these sites, and shut them down, and oh, by the way, they registered probably another thousand sites that they could locate this under. So this is kind of where you're seeing people's, people have interest, they have money, uh, there are bad guys that are willing to put up websites with domain registrations, kind of seeing full circle as to where this is going. Different, uh, different angle on things, and I've got uh, a few minutes here left. Uh, this is texting, right? There's not a lot of preventative measures that can be done for here, but certainly from an employee awareness perspective, um, texts like this could come into phones if uh, phone numbers are known, um, and uh, texts might say here and go to this website, or uh, that one's kind of been a, that was a local message, literally was being posted by one of the police departments um, as a message for uh, in our area. Uh, as something to be watchful of. But then uh, kind of more broadly and probably more popular was this one. Uh, this was FBI of San Diego, but nationally uh, there were concerns about this, which was a Costco uh, text, right? Oh, everybody loves Costco. And if you're a, uh, you know, uh, a loyal customer, right? Or maybe a lot of people that are at Costco might be a, you know, an advanced member or a associate member, Here's a link. Oh, great. What can I do? What can I get? What can I, you know, um, and then by following these links, that's where you're getting malware, ransomware, and so forth. So not a lot you can do about it other than uh, probably be uh, have some awareness in that regard. And then obviously uh, mobile device management software can help. All right. This one um, is just a generic uh, talk, uh, again, from Department of Homeland Security about um you know, your, your same organization uh, that maybe has uh, email on-prem or cloud now has a significant uh, remote workforce. Your email is traveling a similar path to what it traveled before, either it came from the cloud or from your organization and traveled to the, organ, uh, to the remote employee's computer. The VPN and apps are similar to maybe what they had experienced in the past, although the volume of it certainly has gone up and the sensitivity to, uh, to patching has gone up. Well, what's changed is patching an antivirus backup pattern. So you used to be able to use group policies because you were on the wire or on the wire all the time and in the office. So group policies worked. Guess what? They might not be working anymore. Uh, group policies tend to not work at home. Uh, your VPN, you're only occasionally connected. So what if you're not connected when antivirus uh, updates are going and, and things of that nature? So we ask you to be mindful about uh, patching antivirus and, and backup of files that used to maybe be stored on a drive at the uh, organization are now stored on the drive of a computer that is unprotected, uh, things of that nature. Also, the firewall that they used to stand behind uh, and work behind, which was a great organizational firewall and maybe had all the updates done, is now says Xfinity on the front of it or says Linksys, right? And it's they installed it six years ago and they're not sure are there patches for it? Didn't even know, right? So it's a really uh, crummy, if non-existent or uh, certainly unmanaged firewalls. So it's out of those that they're doing their browsing. It's out of those that their applications are having conversations with the internet, uh, an internet that uh, continuously is fraught with uh, challenges. So again, this is an issue where, or an area where uh, technologies can be used to provide additional uh, cloud-delivered firewall services to those remote endpoints and to filter um, through cloud access security brokers um, what type of traffic uh, is legitimate versus illegitimate and what do you as an organization, maybe uh, from a policy perspective, where can they go and where should they be going? And also, where are they going, right? Uh, so reporting and, and so of that. So, um, that's another ballpark uh, technology that can help in that space. 
payments. You know, we're not, we're not concerned necessarily about payments that went directly to banks. Uh, those payments uh, have probably come and gone. Uh, they went in, a, in waves in the last couple of weeks, at least for the initial stimulus payments, uh, should there be more. Our concern is primarily around payments that are going in checks uh, or are going as kind of wave two for people where uh, they didn't have, um, they had filed their taxes in 2018 or 19, but either used a provider, they didn't provide their home address, or, um, or I'm sorry, their bank information, um, or maybe they didn't file, right? And oftentimes this is disparately the uh, underserved, the, um, the poor, um, and others. So, and now uh, good old, uh, the government has also now come up with something called Get My Payment, which is for those secondary filers to go provide that information so that payments can be made. Well, guess what? You can imagine that, A, given the amount of information that's out on the internet, some of these forms can be filled out on their behalf. And if they can't be filled out with the information they know, then they'll simply go out and go get it. Uh, so on the Get My Payment app, uh, there's been a number of frauds where people are filling in those forms and redirecting those $1,200 to more payments into uh, illegitimate bank accounts simply by providing some information. So the IRS is urging you know you to be on the lookout for those. I kind of highlighted that, but then look you know use our guide to figure out which IRS tool even to get your payments. So there's a lot of confusion regarding payments and uh, and how this goes. And so pointing out some of the things that are uh, that have been scams as of recent. Um, this one's a little bit of a repeat from March, but I thought it was worthwhile. Uh, just another mention about websites and effectively things like this, which you know certainly look legit, right? It almost makes us want to click, of course I need to update, download my flash. Well, really that entire website and that pop-up uh, is illegitimate to get go. So the patching mechanism for your workstations, um, you certainly want to get out of your users' hands uh, so they don't have to worry about things like uh, pop-ups where they could be legitimate, could be illegitimate. And uh, and this is one example of what is an illegitimate uh, download and taking you to uh, download malicious code to your website or to your uh, computer. So in, in wrap, um, we have these weekly uh, events on Wednesdays. Uh, so this is outside of the cadence of once a month where we have this month in cyber. We've been doing these weekly Wednesdays uh, ever since we did it on the, uh, starting on the first of the month. We talked about resources that are available for, to help you as a remote employee. We talked about Teams Voice. On April 8th, we talked about how to do file sharing and backup those workstations that are out in the field how to do patching the antivirus for out in the field, so kind of management. On April 15th, we talked about vendor promotions. What's Cisco and Microsoft and HP and all the other vendors that are out there, what are they doing to offer things to uh, remote employees? Do they have any deals going? Because I'm in the market for X, but I'd love to pay less. Uh, or I'd like to take advantage of Microsoft monies to enable some of these technologies, you know, what's around. So vendor promotions and, uh, Last week we did uh, scams and protection for that. And this week, uh, tomorrow, we'll be doing uh, employee engagement and productivity. Uh, we're gonna continue these Wednesday webinars um, through the month of May uh, also as we can continue to be remote employees and uh, just trying to provide education and uh, thought leadership in this space. And last but not least, um, you know, there's a number of things that you can take advantage of. We have kind of a crawl, walk, run, security strategy. We ask that all of this be done for your organization um, and certainly for these items that are uh, building here on the right. All of those items are available to be tried uh, as part of a trial and I should add that that internet security DNS, we also have the capability to do a trial of uh, Cisco Umbrella for qualified customers that want to do this. Uh, we're beginning to enact this for a number of uh, organizations even with remote employees out in the field uh, it's a relatively straightforward uh, item to uh, to deploy. Our website's there. Uh, all of the items that are here in terms of uh, recaps are available under our coronavirus page. The statements, the related blogs, the solutions, and scams. Uh, we're trying to keep that fresh and make sure that you're up to date on everything. So with that, I appreciate all your time. If there's any questions, I certainly can take them. Um, Samantha, is anything in the IM uh, or chat window? Otherwise... We'll uh, conclude. Nope. Not seeing any questions.
not okay. seeing any questions um, in the question panel, so uh, we can hang out for a couple minutes and we can th wrap things up now. Um, so yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending, and uh, you know, hope this was uh, enlightening. And again, remember our webinar tomorrow, uh, weekly webinar series at 11 o'clock. Thank you.